Hi, I'm JC Peretz with AllStarCharts.com, and we are here at the Market Technicians Association Annual Symposium with Dan Wontrowski. Dan, thanks for being here. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks, man. So I thought you were on a killer panel. Uh, Larry Berman, <laughs> yeah. uh, Ralph Acampora, Katie Stockton. Yep. I thought that was terrific. Yep. You know, you brought an interesting dynamic to the table with your expertise in, in, in millennials and understanding those sort of demographics. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about a little bit about how you... Um, you're, you're, you're a classic technician, right? and now you're bringing in this added data. How are you able to incorporate both together? Well, we, you know, we try to look at some of the reasons why the charts do what they do. So I've been a chartist for about 20 years or so, and you start off with the price data, and then you move on to volume studies, advanced decline, and you know, where that brought me over the years was actually charting a lot of the economic data that's out there. Uh, and one of the things that has always intrigued me was population cycles, only because the baby boomers took up so much media space all the time when I was a kid growing mm -hmm. up. Gen X, anybody Gen X out there, you know we're part of a baby bust. We effectively got left behind. We're about half the size of the baby boomers. So, you know, you look at these things uh, as you're growing up and it becomes very interesting to you. Then all of a sudden, the millennials kind of you know, explode onto the scene. These are the kids of the boomers, and they're the biggest generation this country has ever seen, you know, on an actual basis, right? So we think they're going to be huge disruptors, uh, and what we're trying to do is incorporate it into our models. And there are quantitative ways to do that. They have ratios of, say, middle aged productive workers to older age productive workers to younger age productive workers. Well, what's very interesting is w w when you graph that data and you overlay it against something like a, a multiple cycle, like the PE of the S&P 500, the correlation that shows up that gets calculated is, is phenomenal. Um, There's a very high correlation to as a huge boom population, as it moves up through the ranks, the multiple really seems to react uh, and be impacted by that. So that's really what was exciting for me to kind of incorporate that into things. And, you know, to be fair, as a technician, we all look at um, our signs, we all have our signals, right? And so on a short-term basis, I, I'm prepping for volatility myself. So the millennial story isn't everything's going to be great in the stock markets for the next 20 years. Of course not. I mean, no bull market has ever worked like it. But we do think they are going to be impactful because within the next 10 years, next 10, 20 years, this group is going to be huge investors and savers. And they're going to have a lot more money than people give them credit for. That's going to be disruptive to the markets, in my opinion. Now, you, you mentioned that currently you're preparing for some volatility. Here we yeah. are in early April. Is that because of other classical technical techniques that you use, or does some of that millennial sort of data fit into that short-term thesis? Yeah, I mean, the millennial data wouldn't fit in at all to that, believe it or Got not. It. So anything from classical technical signals, you know, divergence, looking at market breadth, what sectors are leading, um, what market caps are leading or lagging or falling behind, volume patterns, you know, one study we look at is institutional participation in this market versus you know, retail participation. Sure. And, and one of the things people forget is off the bottom, the 2009 bottom, it's been an institutionally driven tape. Retail, for the most part, turned their backs on this bull market years ago. And the baby boomer, as an investor and a driver of equities, where they had the biggest impact like in the 80s and 90s, yeah. A lot of them, to a huge part, moved over into fixed income as safer, the lower volatility play. So you basically had a low volume, non-adopted bull market that's been institutionally driven here and actually running on fumes through, you know, funny policy, whether it was monetary policy, QE, stock buybacks, which drive, which play a huge, a huge role. So really, the retail investor has not come to be a, a huge part of this tape yet, and my theory is that the millennials, not tomorrow, not next week, but within the next decade, are going to gravitate to Wall Street as a client because they're going to need 401ks, they're going to need 529, so on and so forth. So I do look at the, the, the classical technical signs for short-term analytics, um, but longer term, the millennial story is, I, I, I think it's, it's bigger than, than a lot of those. Sure. You know, it, you, you brought out a lot of great stats and everything like that. You want to talk about maybe one... Um, you know, maybe a, 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 a premise about millennials that um, is, is it might seem like common knowledge that your data suggests is wrong? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So the student loan um, debt. So everybody talks about this one trillion dollar monster out there, and actually by now it's about 1.5 trillion in, in total student loan debt. So to put it in the context, you know, I guess total uh, GDP or total government debts around 20 trillion at this point. So you're talking about seven percent of our total public sector debt picture here. And so one of the things I get all the, the pushback that I get all the time is. Well, these kids are, you know, overloaded with debt. They don't have a job. They're living in my basement. And a lot of the economic data that we've uncovered really kind of um, dispels a lot of that. So in particular with student loan debt, what we've uncovered with, and this is all publicly available information, between 2005, uh, 2005 and 2015, the millennials that graduated with them, 40% of that group graduated with zero debt. Wow. means the parents or scholarships or grants. The bigger number is this, 70% of the millennials that graduated undergrad college, this includes private school from 2005 to 2015, 70% of that group had less than $25,000 in student debt. Wow. So the point is, it's a huge macro number, this $1.5 trillion, but it's unequally dispersed. And so it doesn't tell the whole story. So most, the majority of that cohort are actually better off than, than people give them credit for. Again, it's, it's sort of media saying, hey, there's this one trillion dollar monster, sure. so let's make a story out of it. When the truth is, it's not hitting them all equally. The average debt load for a millennial is anywhere between twenty-five to $30,000 coming out of college. I'm not saying it's insignificant. It's a car payment, sure. effectively. But again, it's the stories of um, $200,000 in debt, those are the tail ends of, of that story. So student loans, uh, with that number, not everything is what you see there. And with respect to the workforce, you, you brought out an interesting number then in a couple of years, they're gonna, millennials are going to represent, what, 50% of the workforce? 50%. They're already 35% of the workforce right now. So okay. they're, they're already the largest portion of our adult population. So bigger than the boomers, bigger than Gen X. Uh, and they're already the biggest portion of the workforce at 35%. Now, within a couple of years, it's going to be 50%. Somebody at the tail end of our panel uh, had mentioned it's going up to 75%, which is a, a phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. number. Now, I hadn't seen that. Um, it seems pretty excessive, considering Gen X is going to be living longer and staying in the workforce longer. But I, look, it's, it's, it's possible. It's an uptrend. For sure. It's certainly an uptrend, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. I'm right. JC Peretz with AllStarCharge.com. We're here at the MTA Symposium in New York City. And thank you. Hey, thank you very much, man.